uh, and, uh, and aquariums have a very important role in this whole thing, which is um, at, at the scariest level, they are the ark. They are where the insurance populations of these animals uh, can be looked after and understood and studied. Because of many of these animals, we don't even understand um, how they live in the animals. Is also, they're not furry, they don't have wet, watery eyes and an instant peel to, appeal to the masses. They're not gorillas, they're not, you know, they're, they're not primates, they don't have the things we relate to. So as a consequence, they kind of can get forgotten a little bit. So um, they certainly don't star in many TV shows. So the reality is, um, when the, uh, the zoos uh, stick up for them and put them in exhibits and show them to the world, you are, you are reaching people and you're, you're spreading that word. You're getting people to understand and appreciate the essence of what these animals are all about. Um, and then also, uh, with a lot of these exhibit animals, um, the backstory of their conservation and what the zoo is doing, how they're taking the pennies that the people have spent to enter the zoo in the first place, how they're taking that money and applying it directly to, uh, to, to try and give the, uh, uh, these creatures uh, a, happy, a happy end. So you have a particular enthusiasm for the axolotl. I'm sorry, I, I do. I'm, I'm leaning into the axolotl a lot here because it is one of my, um, it's one of my favourite creatures. I've kept these things as pets uh, for many years. I first met them in a, a college and laboratory. Um, I looked after them at my own school um, and then I, I managed to get some of my own, which I um, I've, I've loved. I had one live for a very long, long period of time. Um, and. I just got connected to them, but I always get, I always have my axolotls, and I wondered what it was about the axolotls. Um, um, where, where, where did they come from? Uh, what was it like in the wild where these things lived? So um, I f was able to abuse my position a little bit later on in life and, and take an entire film crew out to the place where they, they come from, which is one, they're, they're endemic, not just to Mexico, not just to Mexico City, but to one lake and that lake doesn't exist anymore. It's just become a, a, a few channels of water. It's literally a few ditches joined up. Um, so this animal was in big, big trouble. I went out there expecting to see a, a lake, you know, as, as you would, and there was nothing of the water there. The lake is effectively an open sewer in places, so you've got the largest human city in the world plonked right on top of that lake. So it is filling up with all the, uh, all the, the pollutants we add to the water. Um, on top of that, we've introduced lots of non-native species because we've messed the water up. Only things like tilapia and carp can survive in these waters. So they've been introduced, and of course they're predators, so they eat the eggs of these things. So in many ways, the axolotl symbolises the, the situation we're in as a species of our own. You know, the humans and, and, and the species we share the planet with. And the axolotl is a, is a sort of a, a metaphor of our position on Earth. Mexico City is in a bowl, it's kind of a closed system. The axolotl is sharing its existence, uh, not much of an existence at the moment, there's probably just a handful of them left, they may even be extinct in the wild. Um, and it's sharing that existence with the largest population of humans, uh, am I boring you, sorry, um, the largest population of humans on the planet. Um, and for me, if we can save the axolotl, which isn't just this weird black salamander, it's actually, it's food, it's, it's, it's almost a religion to some people, it's uh, culturally very, very important. Um, but if we, can, if we can save this animal, which means so much to so many people, then there's hope for conservation in the bigger context as well. And, and what I didn't mention about the Aristotle is we all owe something to this animal. So I think it would be a very nice repayment of that debt to actually save it in the wild. Um, the early days of stem cell research was conducted with these animals. The reason these animals are so widespread in laboratories and educational facilities is because they were the creatures that led the way when it came to studying how our cells differentiate. So what that basically means is you can lop off a bit of an axolotl, um, their legs, the gills, I've even seen them regenerate half a head and they will literally grow that missing bit back. And that's, what, that's the magic of axolotls. At a cellular level, they're fantastic creatures. As a whole organism, they're amazing creatures as well. So in some ways, it's sort of a, a potted uh, history or a potted example of what's happening to amphibians um, all over the world. So for me, it's a bit, I mean, I've got a champion the axolotl for that reason. So you do feel there is hope for these threatened species of reptiles and amphibians? There has to be. There has to be hope because if there's no hope, we might as well give up now. Um, it, the conservation is, is a depressing uh, place in some ways because all you hear is um, is all the bad stories. There are stories. There are good stories. There are stories which are, are working well. I mean, we're looking at 
all sorts of amphibian reptile conservation stories around the world are working. We are beginning to understand these things and learn more about them. Um, it's mainly because we don't have the money behind us to really make a difference and we have to pick and choose which ones we save, which is a terrible situation to be in. If we can just share... Uh, I, every time I sit on the motorway and I see a supercar go past, uh, it might be an Aston Martin, it might be a Ferrari, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what it is, I, I, I look at them and think, I could save a species with the value of that car. That's Or maybe two, <laughs> maybe three even. I mean... That's the scariness of it. It's all about where we choose to spend our money. And for me, um, you know, the we can't live without the natural world. And uh, to, to, to actually invest some money in undoing some of the wrongs that we have, uh, we have uh, lay upon the land, then uh, I, I, it's got to be one of the best investments there is. It might not make much of a financial return on it, but surely you're going to feel good for it. So... Is that what this guy's doing? This one's doing some bizarre, um, some yoga, some actual yoga. Skin going on. shorts. Yeah. <laughs> that was fab. That's actually covered all of my questions. Is that all right? Yeah. Because um... they are. I mean, so it is difficult to stay positive about all these things because it is it you know wherever everywhere you go. But you know, when I was out in uh, in Sochi Milko um, making maybe the last film. Who knows? I don't know. I've got to get an update on what the situation is. And that's a very good reason to uh, to um, uh, appreciate what Biaza are doing because, of course, it's it's, it's joining up organisations like Biaza with situations in the field. There's people in, in, in Mexico City that know much more about axolotls than I'll ever know. But they've got the field experience. They're there doing what they can. And we're out here being worried about it. But if we put two of those things together, magic can happen. Um, so for me, when I went out to see axolotls in the wild, because the handbook to the threatened reptiles and amphibians of the world, which was produced a few years ago, by the way, it's n the handbook sort of suggests it's small. There's that many threatened reptiles and amphibians in, in the world. That this thing is huge. It's like a, a great big brick of a book. And that was the latest published stuff on the axolotl in the wild. And it sort of suggested they were still there. And then when I went out to, um, and met up with various people that were working with axolotls, we went round to all the... Um, the, the Chinampas, all these little channels in the uh, in in the uh, what remains of the lake, and um, we didn't catch any. We just caught lots and lots of invasive species of fish, um, and it was really depressing to the point where I, I really was depressed. I mean, it was it was a very sad ending to the film. It was only when they they said, "Oh, you want to see axolotls?" I said, "Yeah, that's why I'm here." You know, and the guy goes, "Well, I can show you axolotls. They're not truly wild, though." So I said, well, yeah, let's see what you've got. You know, I've seen them in labs, I've seen them in the zoo. It's not, again, it's not the same. I wanted to see them in the wild. And they said, well, they're not wild, but they're in the water and they're outside. So I thought they were going to take me to a, a captive pond. And then, but they took me to the, uh, I forget which Olympics, the Olympics, is it 1964? Was it 64, 66? Anyway, the Olympics around in the 60s was held in Mexico City. And in order to... Um, uh, place the rowing um, sport, uh, sport of rowing. They had to dig a rowing course through the Chinampas. So there's these big, deep uh, channels cut for the rowers to row up and down. It's still there now. They use it as, it's like a part of a park where people can go and row on a Sunday and run around the outside, run around the perimeter. And it's where everyone goes to be fit in on a Sunday. Yet in the water there were axolotls. And I saw them, I caught them, I held them, I fell in love with them all over again. And when I asked them, why, why do you consider these not wild? And they said, well, they're not out there in the, in the lake. I said, well, it, it's kind of part of the lake. Did anyone put them here? No. Well, the chances are they're as, as wild as you can get. And the other thing is, is Xochimilco hasn't been a wild lake since the first Aztecs, the Nahuatl Indians, or rather, settled it um, all those years ago. So, for, you know, thousands of years ago, that, that, that lake started its journey of, to, to stop being natural. So... And the actual has survived right up until the uh, very close to the present day. So, as far as I'm concerned, and genetics would be the answer, these animals are about as close as you can get to wild. And they were still there last time I looked. Um, I've not been for several years. But there's a happy, there's some hope at least that these animals can be saved in the wild. Uh, and straight after this interview, I'm going <laughs> to go, go write to my friends out there and see if they're still there because uh, it's been a long time to have had any, any connections with Mexico. But. So these are really extraordinary species, as are all of the top ten reptiles and amphibians. Um, why is it that things like giant pandas and the fluffies get so much attention, and these incredible species are a little bit 
Well, wow. this is the story of my life, really, is that I stick up for the... I, don't, don't get me wrong, I appreciate a panda, and I love a chimpanzee, just like the next person. But I look around and I see a lot of money being spent on these species. It may not be enough for them, even, but I see a lot of people. They've got friends. You look up gorillas, look up mountain gorillas. There's organi dozens of organisations all hell-bent on saving mountain gorillas. Now, there's nothing that is 100%. There's no axolotl society. There's no one behind these animals trying to save this one species. And the reason being is, okay, it's got eyes, just about, but they, they don't have, they haven't got warm blood, they haven't got fur, they haven't got forward-facing eyes and a smile that we can relate to. So I think it does simply come down to we like looking after the things we resemble the most. Um, so obviously primates are high on that. And if, they, if, if we share something, so something like the whales and dolphins, for example, um, we feel they share something with us, they're intelligent. So, you know, that's another appealing bunch of creatures. You start talking about snakes, lizards, frogs and salamanders, and most of the responses you'll get will be negative ones, or if not, very rarely is it indif indifferent, but it, it range from being indifferent to negative. Very few are really, really positive about these things. So, so I think it basically boils down to a simple thing, which is re we relate to things that are furry with wet, watery eyes. And uh, unfortunately, our amphibians will never be those things. Perfect.